Your homework is to memorize this and write it 15 times. Welcome to the coolest, stiffest half hour of fun on TV. This is Brain Stew with Jennifer Pulley. What's on the agenda for this week's Brain Stew? Well, let me tell you. We investigate the force of friction. What is friction? How does it affect you and me? Can friction help NASA test airplane and space shuttle tires? We'll find out. Plus, what does building trucks have to do with friction? Well, we head over to the Ford plant in Norfolk, Virginia to answer that very question. Oh, oh, I almost forgot. You'll need a helmet this week. We're going on a bike ride. So put down the remote and stay tuned for Brain Stew. It's up next. Friction can be useful, you know. If there was no such thing as friction, when you tried to walk down the sidewalk, you'd slide all over the place. It would be like walking on ice, but even more slippery. Look out, no friction. Oh, give me friction. So here it goes, friction between the bottom of your shoe and the pavement allows you to control your steps so you don't fall all over the place. Friction can be good. Another example of when friction is useful is when you ride a bicycle. The friction between the tire and the pavement allows you to control your bike so you don't slide off the road. The bigger the tire, the more the friction and your tire actually grips the pavement so you can be in control of your bike. Friction is also special because it can produce heat. An easy way to see how friction produces heat is to take your hands and rub them together. In a few minutes, your palms are starting to get hot. That's the heat that the friction produced. Oh, remember what I said about bicycle tires? Well, after a while, your tire starts to wear out because of the heat produced by friction from the road. The same concept applies to even bigger tires that grip the road, like a car. But you know, I'm not talking about even bigger tires. I'm talking about airplane tires or even space shuttle tires that grip the runway. Hi, I'm here with my friend Tom Yeager at NASA Langley. Where'd you take me this morning, Tom? To the Aircraft Landing Dynamics Facility. Uh, we've been in operation now since the mid-50s looking at aircraft landing gear systems, tires, wheels, and brakes. Okay, now you know the show's about friction, right? That's right. What is friction? Friction is basically the uh, force developed between two moving bodies, or in other words, they're looking at it as the resistance to motion. And uh, we look at it from the standpoint of how a tire be be performs on a pavement surface. There are other concepts, of course, involved uh, with the uh, phenomena of friction. Okay, and why is it such a phenomenon? Uh, it enters our lives in, in many different ways. Uh, every form of motion involves some type of friction, whether it be in a, a car engine, whether it be a tire on a pavement, whether it be an airplane going through the uh, uh, lower atmosphere. Uh, you've got to develop friction in order to accomplish going from point A to point B. So are we creating friction right now? I mean, or no? Uh, in a way we are, just in talking. Uh, your air passages and whatever, you can develop friction and, and pronounce the words that you're talking. Uh, when you're walking from one point to another, you're developing friction between your feet and the pavement. So we're here at the Aircraft Landing Dynamics Facility. So right. you're testing how aircraft land, how aircraft lands, and how you can make it better. Right, uh, both in landing and in takeoff. And of course, some of our work has involved the space shuttle uh, operations down at Kennedy out, out in California. People come here to test things. Right here in Virginia. Right, people, Yay. people like Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and Airbus. They want to find out how to improve their landing gear systems on their new airplanes, and so we do tests to give them that information. Well, can you show me some things that I can see or touch? Sure. We've got a couple of shuttle tires over here, uh, one of them which uh, is quite severely worn. We, we did test at our track facility a couple of years ago looking at this shuttle tire. This is torn up. Right. When we first got it, it looked like that tire there in a new condition. This represents about 10 landings on the shuttle, mm -hmm. both from a steering standpoint and from a braking standpoint. This looks really smooth to me. Like, I don't think I would want my tire on my car to look this smooth. That's Because it doesn't right. seem like it would grip the ground very well. That's, that's exactly right. It only has what we call, uh, 
grooves that go around the circumference of the tire. Yeah. Whereas if you look at an automobile tire. This here looks more like my car tire. Right. Yeah. And the difference here is that you've got these cross slots in the tread. Okay. They give you uh, the ability or gives the tire the ability to get rid of water much better than if it just had the circum uh, the grooves going around the uh, circumference. Because water tire. is going to decrease your friction. friction. Right. All you right. can get into what we term a hydroplaning condition mm -hmm. where if you're going fast enough, the tire will literally lift off the ground. And you have no control. Right. When you're off the ground, you lose your, your friction entirely and you can't steer and you can't brake. And you slide all over the road. And you slide all over the uh -huh. road. So uh, that that's a case where you don't have enough friction and you want more. And to do that, you, you can improve the tread design of the tire. Tom, what am I standing underneath? Am I going to get hurt here? <laughs> Not exactly. It's a huge contraption. It's a, it is. Uh, and a lot of people refer to it as a tinker toy because of all the steel tubes that go into its uh, construction. Wow. It weighs uh, roughly uh, 52 tons, or the equivalent of about uh, 26 automobiles. And right now, we're standing by a, a, a fighter airplane uh, landing gear uh, system that we're looking at from the standpoint of uh, reducing the loads going back into the uh, to the airplane itself. Now how do you get this carriage moving so that you can actually take this tire and touch it down and see what's going to happen? Okay, we use basically what uh, people refer to as a uh, water jet uh, concept. Uh, we have uh, 26,000 gallons of water in a large reservoir and behind that water we have pushing on it uh, 3,000 pounds per square inch of air. There's no, there's no engine that runs this? No, thing? no engine at all that runs it. It's just uh, propelled by this water jet. We allow the water to uh, hit a bucket, a turning bucket on the back of the carriage. Uh -huh. So you push all that water at high speed into here. Right. High and then it comes out here. Right. Right. And then what do you do with that extra with the water? With the water, we just let it go into the field to uh, keep our grass green. Oh, basically. good. <laughs> and we get uh, a new supply of water from the city. Beginning launch sequence. So the water's coming out so fast that it causes this carriage to go how fast? With the combined uh, pressurized water coming out of this 18-inch uh, diameter nozzle, we can develop 2 million pounds of, of thrust on the carriage. And that equates to about uh, 20 Gs acceleration. To put it in a different light, uh, we can get the carriage from a standing start up to 55 miles per hour in only 9 feet of actual distance. And in 400 feet, we can get it up to uh, 250 miles per hour. So once this thing is cruising, <clears throat> the water is taking it and it's pushed it and it's cruising, yeah. while it's at its top speed, that's when you lower down the tire? That's exactly right. We'll do test either look at braking or cornering or a combination of both. We've got an 1,800 foot long test section that we can do this in. How does friction um, affect that tire then? We look at the pavement in a dry condition. Okay. It gives us a high friction value. Yep. We look at it under wet conditions that gives us a low friction value. And it's those two extremes that we want to uh, determine how well a given tire pavement combination can perform. We've looked at uh, smooth pavements, we've looked at groove pavement, we've looked at asphalt versus concrete, we've looked at radial tires versus bias ply tires, different tread designs, and all these factors have a role in, uh, in determining how much friction or how much tra traction you can develop between the tire and the pavement. Tom, we've come from the building over there. Now we're looking at this huge carrier <laughs> and this turning bucket. Yes. Uh, this one uh, is much larger than the one we saw over in the other building. Yeah. Simply because uh, we push this carriage at a uh, higher speed than the other one. How fast uh, does this one this go? This one goes 250 miles per hour the versus other the other one about 120 miles per hour. So it's almost twice the speed. And to get twice the speed, we got to get almost twice the water going through uh, to push the carriage up to those uh, uh, those velocities. So you use the same amount of water. You just it's just a bigger area. Bigger that it's area, going into. and uh, the white plumbing structure that's between us and the looks like the house system. kind of thing. Yeah, it's, little, mm -hmm. it's a uh, what we call a rain apparatus that gives us the ability to uh, 
simulate heavy rainfall. So the runway is underneath that then? The, the runway is underneath it. The concrete part is underneath it and it's between the two steel rails that the carriage rides on. Okay, so as it's coming down, you test on the runway and then these big black bands, they look like huge rubber bands. That's right. Where uh, are they? Okay, that's what we term our resting gear system. They're attached to cables that uh, are lined up with this uh, nose block on the far end of the test carriage. Those cables have to be in the right position before we can open the water jet nozzle at the other end, and then we can launch the carriage, do our test run, and it will stop. Uh, it will stop. Now, well, let me ask you a question. What if it doesn't stop? Will this just keep going? <laughs> right. I mean, how? So far, with this uh, carriage and with this arresting gear system, we have not had any failure. This is the sandbox that stops the carrier if there's a malfunction. Of course, between you and me, I think it's where all the NASA engineers play when they get their break. I want to thank Tom for showing me around here at ALDF, ALDF. That's great, right. Aircraft Landing Dynamics Facility. That's great. At NASA, Very NASA. Good. Very good. You guys have so many acronyms around here. Up next, That's we're going good. to the Ford plant to talk trucks. Thanks again, Tom. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>
I wonder if friction has anything to do with it. Doug, what's LubeCon about here? This is called an automatic chain lubricator. What it does is it takes our conveyor chain. Every time a link goes by, it sprays a little bit of oil onto the chain. That keeps the chain from having too much friction and lets the chain last longer. And so that chain is what's pulling all the, the engines and the brakes and everything through this plant then? That's right. It pulls the, the frame through on a converted power and three carrier, which you can see over here. And what happens if the oil were to stop shooting out? Then our chain would wear out quicker and we'd have to replace it. Okay, it would cause too much friction. That's right. So here's a place where we want to get rid of friction. Well, Doug, bit by bit, our truck is coming together here, okay? And each part we see has got something to do with friction. Now, what is going on right here? Right here, we're taking the body, the cab and the box, and we're marrying them together and putting them onto the frame. The engine and the chassis and the brakes, they're all on, right? That's right, we're almost done. Oh, this is so great. And it just drops down onto there. Now, inside of those tubes right there, that slide the truck over. Right, that's called a fork transfer. All right, so it's transferring the truck over. Right. Now, is that lubricated? It, it, we can't lubricate there because of the way it moves and because it's a precision surface that we have we've ground down to a very specific tolerance. You can't just shoot oil in it to prevent friction. That's it right. won't happen. So what do you do then to prevent friction? In that case, we use something called a cam roller. So we take the two surfaces and we roll them across the top of the cam roller. Ah. And that eliminates the friction. Because, well, if, if there was friction, then the, the cab would never get onto the body and then you wouldn't have a truck, right? That's right. Okay. <laughs> Doug, these are weird looking things here with a little ho pipe on the end and a fan. What are these? These are the engines. Oh, the engines that you put in this truck. Well, do you build the engines here? No, we don't build them here. We put parts of them together here, but we get most of them from Cleveland and Canada. Wow, they ship them right here to Norfolk. That's right. Okay, now, tell me a little bit about friction and an engine. Like, okay. what, what does that have to do with each other? Friction and engines don't go together at all. Okay, another bad, bad friction. Very bad. If engines don't have oil in them to lubricate them, they won't last long at all. And you won't be able to drive anywhere. That's right. And your engine will blow up. Right. All right, and tell me a little bit about uh, the Norfolk plant. When was a Ford plant built? The plant opened here in 1925, and we've always built Ford products. They started out building Model Ts. The only time we didn't build any Fords here was during World War II, when they built landing craft for the military. How many people work here? About 2,600. We build almost 1,000 units a day. 1,000 trucks a day? That's right. Completely built, ready to go, ready to drive away. For everyone ordered by a customer. Thank you so much for bringing us here. This is great, a brand new Ford truck. I saw it built. That's Thank right. you. Great to have Brain Stew here. Thanks, let's go. Hey, seatbelt on? Yeah. Let's go. Hi, today I'm going to show you how friction can cause a glass to vibrate and make a really weird sound. Here are the materials that you need. A sink or large pan. I'm using a large pan. The first thing that you need is... This is Martin. Let me come to... The second thing you need is dishwashing liquid. The third thing you will need is water. You also need vinegar, a small bowl, and a stemmed glass. It helps if it's very thin. Step number one, take your dishwashing liquid and your water and make a warm, sudsy solution. You should see lots of bubbles. Mm -hmm. Step number two, wash your hands and your glass in the soapy water. Don't forget to rinse well. Use your water from the beginning to rinse. Step number three, move your materials from the table and put your glass on the table. And wipe your hands. Get a paper towel from an assistant. Step number four, pour your vinegar in your container. Put a very small amount, like this. Step number five, hold the glass at the base firmly with one hand. Now, take your index finger and dip it in your vinegar. 
gently rub your finger around the rim of the glass. As you can see, the results and are yeah. horrifying. No. <laughs> okay. As you can hear, when the rim, when you rub the rim with your finger, it starts to hum. Why? Washing the glass in your hand removes any oil that might act as a lubricant. The vinegar also dissolves any oil that might be present and increases the friction between your skin and the glass. Because your finger skips and pulls the glass, this causes the glass to vibrate. The pitch of the sound that you hear is due to frequency. Hey, that's the number of vibrations per second. Hey, come here. Come here. Do you want to try something really cool? <laughs> okay. The release pitch. Well, you can change that pitch. It's so easy. Just fill a glass halfway with water. Now, listen to the pitch. The pitch is much lower because we added water in the glass. As you look real close, you can see the water vibrating. It's vibrating. You want some health and fitness? Well, come with me. I'm here with my friend David Conti at Conti's Bikes. You own this place? Yes, ma'am. Sure do. Why am I at a bike shop when we're doing a show on friction? What's the correlation? Connection. Well, uh, bicycles uh, have a lot to do with friction. Uh, one of the many things is, is braking. Uh, braking requires friction. Okay. Uh, and braking enables the brake to squeeze on the rim when that brake shoe, which is a rubber compound, mm -hmm. which hits the metal rim, that requires friction, okay. uh, and that makes it stop. You're increasing the friction. You're increasing the friction. Producing maybe a little bit of heat. A little bit of heat, yes, and, definitely. And it's causing the bike to stop. Yep. We, we, want, we want brakes on bikes. Yes, definitely <laughs> want brakes, yes. Now, is that the only example of friction? No, uh, the other big fr uh, piece of friction is the tire. Uh, on mountain bikes or any type of bicycle, the wider the tire, the more friction you have on the road. Uh, which in, enables you to have a little bit more stability as well as uh, a little bit smoother ride too, depending on the tread. Is there any place where friction's bad? We don't want friction. The only thing that you, you definitely don't want friction on is the chain and what we call the drivetrain. You want this chain lubricated to enable it not to have as much friction because the more friction you have on the chain and what they call the free wheel in the back, mm -hmm. it wears out if it doesn't have enough lubrication. Um, and that enables it to, uh, to last a lot longer. Speaking of health and fitness, mm -hmm. get on a mountain bike, get on any type of bike, how is this going to improve our health and fitness? On a bicycle, you get one of the best cardiovascular workouts you can possibly get. When you're pedaling, it's going to get your blood flow moving a lot quicker, which gets that heart pumping, uh, enables you to uh, get the, one of the best pieces of, of cardiovascular workout possible. And then that burns calories and burns fat. Burns calories, and burns fat, and it makes you feel better. Yeah. So, yep. yeah. so get off the couch and get That's on a right. bike. That's right, get on a bike. Oh, we've caused enough friction for today, wouldn't you say? I'm burning up. I gotta go cool off and chill out. My brain still be back as usual next week. I'll see you and your big old brain then. Oh uh, yeah, this is the life. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Those brakes sure work. Hey, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Doug, Doug, Doug.